On the broadcast tonight, North Korea says it'll send a cheering squad to the upcoming Asian Games in South Korea. Seoul doesn't have a problem with that. President Park Geun-hye is seeking parliamentary support. With crucial by-elections coming up at the end of the month, the president invites the floor leaders of the two rival parties to the nation's top office. And as Japan takes action for a major shift in its military policy, China marks the 77th anniversary of the start of an anti-Japan war in a grand ceremony. Changing security dynamics in Northeast Asia, we speak to an expert. Early edition begins now. I see trees of green, red roses. 늘 남편 먼저, 늘 자식 먼저. Lady First라는 말을 믿고 살아온 당신. 오늘만큼은 세상 누구보다 당신이 먼저입니다. 한분한분 한분 특별하게 모시겠습니다. Excellence in Flight, Korean Air. It is 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Beijing, and 6 p.m. on Monday, the 7th of July here in Seoul. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gun Young. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. We begin with North Korea, where we can expect the unexpected, as always. Well, the reclusive state says it'll send a cheering squad to this year's Asian Games that will take place in South Korea's port city of Incheon starting mid-September. And all eyes are now on whether the move will truly turn out, as Pyongyang claims, it to be a conciliatory gesture to mend strained inter-Korean ties. Our Hwang ji starts us off. It seems like North Korea is once again reaching out to South Korea. In a government announcement Monday, the North said it will send a cheering squad to the upcoming 17th Asian Games that will take place in Incheon, a port city in western South Korea. The North said it'll send the squad along with its athletes to improve inter-Korean relations and help create the mood for further exchanges between the two Koreas. It added the move shows Pyongyang's commitment to unification within the nation and on the global stage. If all goes to plan, it would be the fourth time for the North to send a cheering squad to a sporting event in South Korea. The last time the squad visited was nine years ago during the 2005 Asian Athletics Championships also held in Incheon. Officials at Seoul's Unification Ministry say there's no reason to turn down Pyongyang's latest move as the Incheon Asian Games proceed according to international practices. Aside from the cheering squad, the North's announcement also said the two Koreas should put an end to reckless confrontation and open a new chapter of reconciliation. In May, the North said it would send 150 athletes to the Asian Games, which run from September 19th to October 4th. Pundits expect North Korea's participation to raise global awareness of the Games and help to improve inter-Korean relations. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Meanwhile, a U.S. expert says a Pyongyang could significantly boost its nuclear capacity if it completed work on a light water nuclear reactor currently under construction. Well, U.S. nuclear scientist Charles Ferguson, the president of the Federation of American Scientists, says Pyongyang will be able to produce 30 to 40 kilograms of plutonium each year when the light water reactor at its Yongbyon nuclear complex goes into operation. Well, that's enough to make five to six nuclear bombs a year. Now, he adds that the North already possesses at least 30 kilograms of plutonium. Ferguson added it's important not to neglect the issue and urged Washington to bring Pyongyang back to the negotiating table. Back here in this country, President Park Geun-hye has invited the floor leaders of the two rival parties to meet with her at the presidential office this week. It's an attempt to uh, build support for her party ahead of a crucial by-election at the end of the month. Here's our Jim Young-gil with the details. With crucial by-elections coming up at the end of the month, President Park Geun-hye is seeking to rally support around the ruling party by breaking a deadlock at the National Assembly. 
just scheduled a meeting with the flow leaders of Korea's two main rival political parties and chief policymakers on Thursday, which will urge them to pass a series of pending bills and settle unresolved issues. The meeting will be the first of its kind since President Park took office in February last year. She is expected to call for bipartisan cooperation in the passage of urgent bills, such as a government reorganization proposal, as well as a special bill aimed at determining the truth behind the deadly Seoul ferry disaster in April, and supporting the victims' families. The government reorganization bill contains a proposal by President Park to abolish the Korea Coast Guard, which is under fire for its poor response to the ferry sinking that resulted in the deaths of more than 300 people. President Park also plans to push for the passage of bills aimed at increasing social welfare and removing excessive business regulations. This week, the rival parties are set to clash at the National Assembly as confirmation hearings for eight cabinet nominees get underway Monday. With the by-election fast approaching on July 30th, the verification process is expected to be a tough one. Lawmakers from the ruling's Henry party are under pressure to ensure all eight nominees are confirmed to complete President Park's cabinet reshuffle and rally voter support. The ruling party is also hoping to ward off another appointment debacle which could hurt the party's chances in the upcoming election. Opposition lawmakers from the New Politics Alliance for Democracy will attempt to pressure at least two nominees to withdraw as part of efforts to highlight the problems with President Park's personnel appointments. Kim young Arirang News. Well, it looks like financial institutions in Korea and China have started taking necessary steps to create a direct one yuan trading market. Now, this, of course, was one of the major agreements reached on economic cooperation last week between Presidents Park and Xi. The establishment of this market comes amid an exponential increase in the use of the yuan in global trading and payment. Here's our Na hyung -kyung. One of Korea's biggest financial firms, Uri Bank, is expected to be in charge of promoting sales and marketing for the Korean branch of China's Bank of Communications. The head of the Bank of Communications, which was appointed as the Chinese Yuan Clearing Bank in Seoul just last week, predicts the amount of transactions settled in yuan by Korean businesses will nearly quadruple to 300 billion yuan, or roughly 48 billion U.S. dollars a year in the near future. Analysts say this falls in line with China's push for increasing the use of renminbi by banks and businesses in international transactions. The Hyundai Research Institute says China's currency is increasingly preferred to the Japanese yen in global trade thanks to its large economic scale and stability. The Korea Institute of Finance also says as of October last year, the amount of global trade financing settled in Chinese yuan stood at nearly 9 percent, outpacing the euro and the yen and points out that the rate of the yuan's internationalization is 48 times faster than the yen's in the 1980s. In Korea, expectations are high that President Park Geun-hye and Chinese leader Xi Jinping's agreement last week to soon let the two countries' businessmen settle their trade bills in their own currencies will encourage more direct one yuan trading. However, some experts also warn that the growing presence of the yuan will deepen Seoul's economic dependence on Beijing, though it could help ease pressure on the Korean one's appreciation against the dollar. Na hyun -kyung, Arirang News. President Bakane is encouraging Korean firms to take full advantage of Central Asian nations that wish to learn from Korea's experience in manufacturing, IT and plant industries. She was speaking to the economic delegation that traveled with her to Central Asia recently, where the president said by sharing their know-how with the region, Korean businesses will also be able to build cooperation in transportation, textiles, agriculture and education. President Bak also vowed to continue her economic diplomacy wherever needed around the world. Korea and Turkey have agreed in principle to expand their existing free trade deal to include the service and investment sectors. After seven rounds of negotiations, Korea's trade ministry announced Monday that the two sides have agreed to open up their service markets based on the WTO's general guidelines. Korea's chief trade negotiator says Seoul's trade with Turkey has jumped over 30 percent since the deal took effect in May last year. The two countries will seek to initial the agreed terms by the end of the year before it's officially signed within the first half of next year.
Well, Beijing appears determined to continue pressing Japan to stop denying its past wrongdoings. And on this Monday, China marked the uh, 77th anniversary of the start of its second war of resistance against Japan with its largest commemorative event ever. And as our Shin Zemin reports, Chinese President Xi Jinping was there to address the public. Chinese President Xi Jinping commemorated the start of the eight-year war of resistance against Japan at an anniversary event that was larger than ever this year to highlight Japan's wartime atrocities. Although the Chinese head of state avoided mentioning Japan or Abe by name, he said there are still a small number of people who ignore the iron facts of history. The Chinese people who made great sacrifices will steadfastly guard history which is written with our lives and blood. We firmly take the path of peaceful development and we hope all the nations in the world would also walk the path of peaceful development. The Chinese government marks the event every year, but on this day, 77 years later, the commemoration ceremony was more extensive than ever. The event was carried live on China state television, CCTV, Xinhua Online and many other media outlets in the nation. This year's event is significant not only for its scale, but also for the live broadcast and the presence of the president, underscoring its importance. The anniversary comes amid escalating regional tensions and a territorial dispute between the two countries. On July 7, 1937, the armies of China and Japan engaged in a battle that now marks the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. That battle is known as the Marco Polo Bridge Incident. Chinese defenders were attacked, civilians were slaughtered by gunfire, bombs and biological weapons, forced laborers died and women were raped. The large-scale anniversary event comes as China has already started releasing from its state archives written confessions by Japanese war criminals every day for a total of 45 days. One such confession says the Imperial Japanese Army kidnapped 20 women from Korea and China and forced them into prostitution for its troops. Although Beijing has long accused Japan of denying its wartime atrocities, experts say that expanding the scale of this year's anniversary event is a move directed at the Japanese government as a way to force it to face its history. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. A man who marches exclusively to the beat of his own drums uh, against all odds, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has begun to take action on his announcement last week to approve a reinterpretation of its pacifist constitution, which would allow the right to exercise collective self-defense. Well, that means that Japan can come to military aid of a friendly nation under attack. However, the next steps are unlikely to be smooth sailing, as our Son Jong-in reports. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has started to take follow-up steps after his decision to reinterpret the country's pacifist constitution to legally permit Japan to engage in collective self-defense. Speaking to reporter Sunday, Abe said he plans to create a new ministerial post which will be in charge of national security legislation to broaden the scope of the self-defense forces activities. Abe said he would name the minister who will be a person well-versed in security issues to prepare for the large-scale legal revisions during a planned cabinet reshuffle in early September. However, Abe is facing a number of problems. First, his cabinet's approval rating slipped below 48 percent after his decision last week. In polls conducted by Japan's media outlets, Abe's own approval rating stood at 47.8 percent in early July, down from 57 percent in June. It's the first time his rating has slipped below 50 percent since December. In addition, a lawsuit over the cabinet's decision is expected to be filed by a mayor in Mie Prefecture. Matsusaka Mayor Mitsushige Yamanaka says the move is unconstitutional. He has vowed to call on lawmakers, the heads of other municipalities and the general public to join his initiative to promote pacifism. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Well, in the space of uh, two or three days, China, Japan and the two Koreas have shifted their diplomatic alignments, uh, commercial relations and military policies in a power game that may signal the opening of a new era in Northeast Asia. Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to South Korea last week was a 
deliberate slap at North Korea for its stubborn refusal to bow to China's wishes, give up its nuclear program, and cooperate in economic ventures. Well, uh, no eternal friends, no eternal enemies. Well, that seems to be the uh, key phrase in Northeast Asia these days. Dr. Pong Young Shik, senior researcher at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies, joins us live in the studio. Dr. Pong, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. It's been a while. Well, uh, for the first, uh, it's, I think for the first time in a very strong statement by China, Chinese President Xi Jinping said he's right behind President Bakane in terms of denuclearizing North Korea. And he also added that North Korea is no longer China's ally. Uh, what can we expect North Korea's move would be from here on? Well, we're going to see a lot of mixed messages sent uh, from North Korea. Uh, on one hand, North Korea will be remain belligerent and confrontational, uh, basically sending the message that North Korea will not just quietly succumb to the pressure in the aftermath of the summit meeting between Xi Jinping and Park Geun-hye. On the other hand, we'll see uh, many of the conciliatory moves by North Korea, part of its grand strategy to expand its wriggle room in the different and changing uh, context of uh, regional security. Uh, for instance, North Korea just announced uh, that it will dispatch uh, the cheering squad in the upcoming Incheon Asian Games, and North Korea has precipitated its effort to move ahead with a special investigation commission to search for the remainings of the Japanese nationals inside North Korea and uh, missing people. Um, but at the same time, we can expect that North Korea, as usual, will uh, severely protest uh, the regular military drills uh, jointly held by U.S. and South Korea in coming month. Uh, like you uh, briefly mentioned, um, Japan has uh, surprisingly announced uh, that it would lift some of the sanctions on North Korea in return for uh, a reinvestigation of the fate of uh, the Japanese nationals who were abducted uh, to the north in the 1970s and 80s. Well, can anyone imagine uh, North Korea and Japan leaving behind or bearing their historical differences for a deal and uh, for a deal in diplomatic relations? Well, anything is possible, but um, it will be extremely arduous, if not impossible, for both countries to leave behind the uh, unfortunate and treacherous past and normalize its uh, diplomatic relations in the near future. It is true that Pyongyang is really sincere and committed to making this happen, uh, as we witness uh, that uh, the head of the Special Investigation Commission is uh, Mr. Sodeha, who is a vice minister of state security, not just a symbolic uh, figure in foreign ministry. So the top leadership in North Korea is sending very clear signal to the world, including Japan, that the top leadership is really committed to this uh, uh, agreement between Pyongyang and Tokyo. But if you look back the track record of bilateral negotiations on the issue of Japan's abductees, uh, the prospect for long-term success of this commission is quite uh, small. Uh, the Japan and North Korea tried the same thing in 1996 and 2002, but uh, those two uh, cases did not reach the ultimate goal, which is the normalization between the two countries. Mm -hmm. And North Korea also promised in 2008 to reopen the probe of the case, but it uh, withdrew uh, from the agreement at the last moment. So, and Japanese government is very well aware of this track record and did not seem to put too much trust in North Korea's intention and the long-term prospect of this uh, uh, joint uh, commission to be truly successful in the long run. So we have to wait and see. Well, you can't be friends with everyone in the realm of politics and diplomacy and sometimes your enemies turn out to be your best friends in times of need. Well, right now, Japan's uh, right here's uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is close to getting his wish, a collective self-defense. The U.S. is saying okay with that. And, of course, we are strongly against that. So how would that have affected the dynamism between the three countries' relations in the near future? The uh, reinterpretation of the Article 9 of Japan's uh, uh, you know, peace constitution uh, is a, a new uh, change in the security dynamics uh, in Northeast Asia, especially in the context of trilateral security cooperation uh, between you know, Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington. 
But at the same time, Park Geun-hye administration uh, does not blindly and unconditionally oppose to this new change. The main concern for South Korea is uh, that the Japanese government has not has not clearly explained to South Korea and other countries the scope and nature of the reinterpretation of the Constitution and the Japan's exercise of its uh, right to collective self-defense. Uh, self uh, the, uh, according to the uh, announcement by the Abe administration, then Japan would only exercise the collective uh, right to collective uh, self-defense when there, the danger is di directly and urgently threat the very existence of Japan as a sovereign country and impose a menacing threat to the liberty and safety of people and countries uh, close to Japan. But it is rather uh, ambiguous and arbitrary uh, how you define those uh, threats. So South Korea is still waiting for the Japanese government to come up with clearer explanations about uh, how Japan will actually potentially exercise its right to collective self-defense. Well, um, Xi's uh, visit this time around, it was uh, seen by many experts as a test, uh, it, be, it being a test of close U.S. ties with South Korea and Japan, and which it believes that it's being used as a uh, checking, uh, you know, counter-checking its rise. So it's probably critical uh, for South Korea at this point to uh, further strengthen the new friendship, but also, you know, make sure the old friend doesn't feel left out. So how do we best balance, uh, keep the balance in this region? I think, uh, Connie, you already uh, captured the essence of the uh, opportunity and dilemma for South Korea very clearly, that the goal for South Korea is keep the old friend happy and welcome the new friend. Because uh, South Korea cannot make a false choice. South Korea cannot choose uh, China over the United States or choose uh, remain with the United States uh, by distancing uh, China. Uh, the right choice for South Korea is maintain and improve good relations with both countries because both countries are very vital to South Korea's national interest to be realized. The uh, trade volume of South Korea with China uh, in the north of 200 billion U.S. dollars is more than South Korea's trade volume with U.S., Russia, and Japan combined. And you cannot discount China's influence upon North Korea. So it makes reason uh, for South Korea to have maintain a good relationship with China. And at the same time, U.S. is uh, vital to South Korea's uh, national security. So uh, old friend, good friend, new friends, the right answer is make uh, good, as many good friends as possible. Right. Uh, well, Korea has done a fine job of this tightrope balancing act so far. Let's hope we, we continue to do an excellent job in that. Uh, we look forward to having you back here again to explain us more about what we can expect from Korea and this complicated relationship. Thank you so much, Dr. Bong Young-sik. Thank you. We're all destroyed. Digging deeper. Getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Well, tensions peaked over the weekend in Israel after autopsy results showed a teenager was burned alive by the perpetrators. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has promised a firm response. Here's our Khan Kim with the story. Israel has arrested several suspects over the abduction and murder of Palestinian teenager Mohammed Abu Kuder. Security sources say they have six suspects in custody, but this could rise depending on how the investigation goes. Jewish suspects are being questioned by Israel's Shin Bet security agency, but no further information has been released. Lawyers for the suspects say they have no connection to the teenager's murder. We do not yet know all the details according to all the publications and what we have understood. It is difficult at this stage to understand if there is a connection between the suspects and this specific incident. Investigators, however, believe Kuder was murdered by far-right Jews as revenge for three Israeli teenagers 
who were killed last month. They burned my son. They will not bring back my son. My son's blood is worth more. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said he would respond firmly to the killing and use all means available to bring the perpetrators to justice. He added that he would not allow extremists to ignite conflict in the region. However, tensions between Israel and Palestinians are bubbling over. Israel launched airstrikes on 10 sites in the Gaza Strip late Sunday in response to rocket fire directed at Israel. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And that's all we have for you at this hour. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gan Young. Have a great rest of the night, and we hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow. Bye bye.